because the dean of faculty for economics and, uh, and business. And we're delighted to have the president of the Eurozone, Mr. Dati Bloom, today with us. I'm also delighted to hear that it's not the only the siblings who have uh, difficult to pronounce their names, but uh, the North Europeans do too. Uh, I would like to invite the director of the university to say a few welcoming um, things, and then I will move straight away to, uh, uh, with uh, our distinguished guest, uh, speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will have Q&A. Uh, Mr. Dutton was very keen for him not to deliver a speech in any conventional sense, but for him to listen and respond to questions. So let's uh, go straight uh, to the main subject. Go straight. Only a few words. Distinguished guests, dear students and colleagues, it is my pleasure to welcome to the University of Cyprus the President of the Eurogroup, Mr. Jerome Dijsselbloem. Mr. Dijsselbloem, your presence here today provides our students the opportunity to confer with you and to enhance our understanding of the European Union. Thank you for being with us today. I look forward to sharing with you and our students a productive and aspiring discussion. Thank you very much. It's not very common that we have this uh, wonderful chance to have uh, the highest ranking elected official uh, in, in the Eurozone be with us today. So we're very keen to ask questions, engage in a discussion uh, with him. Uh, of course, these issues can be controversial issues, there is no doubt about this, but uh, I think we will all benefit from a very civilized and uh, uh, productive discussion about issues of common concern. Uh, before I give the floor to Mr. Dazenblum, I would like to say a few things about him, very few. We know it since 2013 he has been the president of, of the Eurogroup. Uh, since 2012 he has been the finance minister of, uh, of the Netherlands. He has been a member of parliament since 2000 and he has uh, held several positions as a policy maker at various levels of government, uh, both in the, in, in the Netherlands and in, in Europe. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Dasselblum and say how, what, how what a wonderful chance it is for us to have you with us. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dean. Um, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining us this afternoon. It is always since I became president of the Eurogroup, I tried to visit as many countries as possible. Uh, and in these visits, you always talk to all the officials, the presidents, prime ministers, ministers, parliament, of course. But I always make sure that there is at least an hour to talk to students or young people from every country, because they are uh, the future of the nation. They are the guys and the girls who have to do it in the next few years to come. Um, so it's very important to hear from you and to hear your opinions. Uh, today I will just briefly talk about where we are in Europe, what the main issues are. And you'll find that many of the issues that are on the top of the agenda in Cyprus, the economy, the banking sector, uh, get its credit available again for new investments, the recovery of the economic growth. All of these issues are on the top of our agenda in Europe as well as they, uh, here in Cyprus. Um, during the crisis throughout Europe, uh, there has been uh, a couple of elements that came back in, every, in all the countries. Of course, on the one hand, structural issues in economies, uh, once the trust was gone in the economy, all of a sudden the structural issues become apparent. The structural flaws in competitiveness, the structural flaws in how government creates a business-friendly climate, uh, but also structural flaws in government financing public deficits, uh, public debt rising rapidly. Another element, of course, in many countries of the cause of the crisis was the, um, the systemic risks in the financial sector. Uh, being exposed uh, after a period of long, a long period of economic growth, cheap credit being available, uh, in many countries the financial problems were uh, exposed when creditors, uh, when investors pulled out, when people were unable to pay their debts, uh, when banks fell over and needed public support. Uh, throughout Europe, this has been a pattern that we've seen in different countries. And as you know, in a number of countries, were unable to, um, to deal with their own problems in the short term. And during the course of the crisis in Europe, we built systems, instruments, 
funds uh, to support countries to get through that period uh, of crisis. And we also build up experience. Uh, and in different countries that we dealt with, we designed very different programs. Not only because the, program, the, the countries were quite different, and the problems that we had to deal with were quite different, but also because we learned. Uh, we learned as we moved through the crisis. I think one of the key issues that we learned from the whole crisis, also from the situation in Cyprus, is that we need equal rules in how we deal with banks. And over the last year, year and a half, a lot of energy has been put into the building of this banking union. Uh, we are now, as of this year, and the official start will probably be in November, we have a single supervisor making sure that the supervision on our banks is all based on the same rules and will be done in the same high quality standards. We have capital requirements. All of our banks need to be capitalized in a much stronger way than they were in the past. And if they take more risks, or they have very concentrated risks in certain areas, they will be asked to have more buffers to make sure that if these risks uh, turn into losses, that they will carry these losses. And if banks do get into trouble in the future, we will make sure that they will all be treated the same way in what is called resolution. Uh, and banks will be uh, dealt with in the same way. The key issue there is, of course, bail-in. Now, in Cyprus, the term bail-in is very well known. Because inevitably, and, and I say this with, uh, with, with sorrow, because well, it's not something that fulfills me with pride or joy, but inevitably, in the situation that we had last year, a year ago, due to the size of the banking sector, the size of the problems, also the way that the balance sheets of the banks were built up, uh, and already the size of the national debt of Cyprus at that time, we had no other option than to ask a large contribution from within the banks in order to save, the, to, to save the banking sector as a whole and in order to deal with these problems. That was a very drastic decision. I'm very much aware of that. And I realized that it was a shock, not just to the financial sector, but to the whole society of Cyprus. And it has led to losses, of course, in terms of economic growth, employment, short-term negative effects. But the principle of bail-in is, um, as a matter of economic principle, the right approach, uh, to my mind, because I feel that those people who have put their money in banks uh, and have profited, taken out the profits in the good years, should also carry losses in bad years. I think that is a matter of principle, an economic sound principle. Um, now the way to do that will always differ per bank, um, but it should not differ between countries, and it should be on the basis of clear rules which are set in advance, which are known to investors, which are known to everyone who could put their money in banks, and should be applied in a level playing field kind of way. So those rules are now an important part of the banking union. Uh, if, uh, on top of the capital requirements and the higher equity and capital uh, ratios of the bank, if on top of the good supervision that we are going to enroll throughout the banking sector, if on top of the bail-in rules more losses are uh, um, uh, still to be dealt with, then there will be a single resolution fund, a European fund, which will over a period of eight years be fully filled up and in that fund we will carry any further losses together uh, in a single uh, resolution fund. That is the outline of the banking union which I think we've done too late. Uh, we should have done it very soon after 2008. We should have dealt with our banks after the start of the financial crisis. Uh, Europe has taken a long time to deal with this, but we're dealing with it now. Lessons we've learned, costly lessons in many countries, also in my country and other countries where banks were set for the economy and society. But we have to do better and we will do better. And setting the bank straight is, I think, also part of the new perspective for our economies. Uh, once the trust returns to our banking sectors, and I know it will return to the banking sector also in Cyprus, 
after the restructuring, after the recapitalization, after the asset quality review and the stress test by the ECB, once the trust returns to our banking sectors, investors will return to our banking sectors and the banks will be able to do once again what they were designed to do in the first place, to serve the economy, to serve our society. In other words, to simply allow new investments uh, and new credits to go into the economy. I think that is a top priority at the moment for the Eurozone, and I know it is for Cyprus. Putting the banks right, getting new credit into the economy, allowing for new businesses to create new jobs. And I think over the course of this year, we will have, uh, this is going to be a crucial year, it's the start of the banking union, it's the start of the ECB work. The process of recapitalization is happening as we speak throughout Europe, uh, in Cyprus, uh, in Greece, but throughout Europe, banks are now looking for new capital. Uh, and I think at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, we will go into a new phase, a phase of economic growth, a new perspective for the Eurozone. Um, I'm open to all your questions. Um, uh, please uh, force me to be more precise where you want me to be more precise. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our debate. All right, with great pleasure, we'll do that. <laughs> Thank you. Right, well, let's take up the challenge of asking good questions here. Let, can I have a show of hands, please, to see how many people? One, two, three, four, okay. We'll start with the, with the three here. Uh, I think I will take, for the sake of giving the chance to more people to ask questions, I will take three questions at a time, and then the minister will respond to these three questions, and then we'll move on to another three questions, and so on. Gentlemen, so, Luis. Um, okay. I think you, you better use the microphone. Yes. Uh, it's uh, clear, Mr. Dyson-Bloom, that uh, an awful lot is invested by you personally, but also, more importantly, by the uh, Eurozone in the concept of a bailing. Uh, it is a concept with a lot of uh, attractive features, some of which uh, you have mentioned. But inevitably, when we innovate, uh, we face difficult questions, sometimes we make mistakes, and um, in the case of Cyprus, the model was applied essentially to the entire economy, to, the, to two banks that were so big, so systemic, uh, that in uh, involving them in this experiment, let me call it, um, we involved the entire economy, the, uh, the business sector broadly, uh, in an adventure, let me call it that. Uh, we had capital controls imposed at the same time, which are still in place. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, to look ahead uh, with Cyprus specifically in mind facing all these uh, enormous problems with uh, non-performing lo non loans that we have, and assuming that we have adopted a good resolution mechanism, so beyond the resolution mechanism, what is it that the Eurozone can do uh, to help us uh, make the bailing concept a success both for you, but also for us who are very much uh, in danger uh, Thank you. So, for instance, here it is. Uh, the thing was inevitable. Uh, but maybe I'll open to a discussion, but I'll leave that for someone else to ask. I have sort of two propositions to put forth and you can, uh, that you can comment on. The first one is that for something that was inevitable, it seems surprisingly ill prepared. Uh, the Troika went into the March 15th Eurogroup without a common position. There was no framework to implement that bailing? Um, if we go back to why are we in the situation that we are in now, I don't think it's fair to go back only a year to the Eurogroup decision, but it deserves to go back even further to see where the problems arose, the problems that created massive risks for Cyprus and the Cypriot economy. The problems did not arise uh, at the time of the Eurozone decision. There was a reason why the Eurozone had to be, you said very explicitly, you have to make mistakes in Brussels. Are you prepared to admit 
I would say let's go back into time a little more and look at where the real problems arose. Um, having said that, could the decision have been different? Could the design of the program have been different? Yes, absolutely. But then there should have been an agreement maybe a year before. So not one year ago, but two years ago. I think a lot of time was spent indecisive. Uh, a decision was postponed and postponed. And being quite frank, by the time it was the 20th of March last year, we ran out of time, the banks ran out of money, and uh, I think all of us ran out of political maneuvering space to find any other solutions. But the first two ones were time, because as you know, the outflow of the deposits didn't start after the 20th of March, but were going on in a big way in advance. There was a big problem in the sector already before a peer group decision took place. As I say, under the, the, the then uh, uh, constraints that we had, time, money, political uh, possibilities, this was the outcome. And this was the outcome that put a great strain on the economic situation. Then we have to ask ourselves the question, would there at that time have been alternatives? Well, of course. There could be no involvement from the side of Europe, and the banks would have gone bust, with tremendous effects on the economy. There is also another possibility we could have had a massive bailout. Because now we designed a program of 10 billion, and the rest, which was 7 or 8 billion, had to come from the financial sector. There was a large agreement on that. Why? Why did we make a massive program of, let's say, 10 or 20 billion, simply borrowing that to Cyprus? That would have lumbered Cyprus for generations with a massive sovereign debt. And it was simply unsustainable. And there are many differences in any circumstance uh, which is feasible, <laughs> able to repay the debt that we are now lumbering the country with in the program. That's where the 10 billion figure came from. So it was inevitable to have a solution that could be carried by Cyprus and people of Cyprus and future generations generations uh, in Cyprus, that the program had to be brought down in size in terms of publicness, absolutely even more, I'm absolutely sure. Um, does that mean that I say that the bailout is a success? I would never call something that has caused so much pain on the economy and therefore in the lives of people a success. But do I defend it given the circumstances? Do I defend it given the fact that the problems got completely out of hand in the years before? Yes, I do. Does the Eurozone stand ready to support, if necessary, Cyprus further in its process of adjustment? Yes. Do I consider it necessary at this moment? I don't think so. The program is, as you know, uh, not fully finished. Uh, it has actually only been implemented for one year. It runs for three years. There is still uh, a lot of money available in the program, and I think some buffers are already built in the program. So I think uh, it's very important to make this uh, program effective and efficient <coughs> by implementing it fully. I think the Cypriot economy is, in a sense, and everyone internationally will acknowledge this, a flexible and strong economy, highly uh, and well trained population, uh, English speaking uh, a population, internationally orientated. So all the fundamentals are there for a strong economic recovery. But it takes implementation of the program. And I think that uh, this is our joint responsibility. What, the, what about the first question, which is about non performing loans and how and whether the Eurozone would, would help in that, in that respect? That non performing loans are a, are a major issue. I, uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, but you have to realize it's a major issue at the moment all of, in all of Europe. In all of the banks, also in Spain, Portugal, even in my country, non performing loans are uh, a, a heavy burden on the banks, on the balance sheets of banks. Banks have to do two things at the same time now. They have to deal in a sensible way with these non-performing loans, restructure them, take some, some of the losses have to be taken, uh, new arrangements will have to be made with the debtors on how and when the money will be paid back. This is going concern, but it takes an extra effort, and an extra effort will have to be put into that. And on the other hand, Banks will have to strengthen their balance sheets, getting in new capital, recapitalizing, restructuring the, uh, the, the companies, uh, so that on the balance sheets, basically the balance sheets have to be cleaned up in order for banks to be able to put new credit out. Okay. 
I have two gentlemen, I have noticed the one last questions. Hang on. Uh, okay, fair enough. If you want, okay, you take priority then, sorry. Sir, excuse me, do you mind if we give priority to, to the student? Please. Uh, I will try. Yes, that's yours. To raise the question. Later on, just that. I was just saying that uh, all the young people speak wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> this was part of my PR story that I'm telling the rest of the world. She's not going to decide who they will speak. Even if we have to in the the Πιστεύω, κατά τη γνώμη μου, ότι είχε χώρες, παραδείγματος χάρη Ελλάδα, που ήταν και εκείνες στην ίδια κακή οικονομική κατάσταση σαν εμάς, όμως εκείνη και κούραμα των αξιογράφων και των ομολόγων, που μας έφεραν και μας έφεραν Γιατί στην Κύπρο να γίνει οικονομία στο κούραμα του κατά τέτοιο. That also makes it you have a different design and a different kind of uh, instrument. And uh, I'm going to Athens tonight, but I'm sure that students in Athens will tell me that what we have done in the program for Greece has also been very, very harsh. And so, uh, but it was very different and it also was very harsh. Uh, I think um, many people in Europe sometimes think that the situation in Greece and in Cyprus is comparable, but I think it's very, very different. The cause of the problems, the structure of the economy, the functioning of the economy, everything's different. So let's not make a comparison where it's not in place. Unfortunately, for both countries, it's very, very harsh. And unfortunately, in both countries, uh, measures still have to be taken in terms of reforming uh, government, reforming public sector, reforming <coughs> the economy, making it more competitive, more open also to attract uh, more investors. So some issues are the same, but the, the differences are very large. Are you, going, <coughs> are you going to have the same conversation in a Greek university? And not this time. I did last time. time. I, I thought so. I thought so, yes. It, it will be difficult, I think. No, no, no. <laughs> You're uh, mistaken. Last time I was in Athens, uh, some months ago, last year, uh, I did exactly the same, like here. In a university? In Athens, yeah. In a university? Uh, no, it's, it makes I a difference. Well, <laughs> okay. It was an institute. I will explain later why. I'm, 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 but they were students. students. They were still they students. students there. <laughs> so the gentleman I promised yeah, that. Uh, in the way that they reacted, in the case of Cyprus, we had a, a case uh, of apples. Some of these apples were rotten. What Europe did, he took the whole case and threw it into the river without taking into consideration the ethical. Uh, the ethical matters because these apples were people. Uh, if Europe wanted to hit the Russians and the Russian apples, you should have the expertise and the long range and also the patience to pick up the rotten Russian apple. Also, if they wanted to hit or to find out uh, other uh, bad apples, they should have reacted in a more discreet way, more ethical and with more patience. Uh, this is bad. This is question. question. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, but it, it's, it's all uh, looking at it with the wisdom of hindsight, perhaps. It, and perhaps you're right, it could have had more precision. Um, but for example, in the way that we dealt with the large deposit holders, uh, involving them in the bail-in, I think would have been inevitable in any case because of the way that the balance sheets of the big banks in Cyprus were built up. Uh, there are, in different banks in different countries, you'll find different balance sheets. Uh, balance sheets in other countries will, you'll see more shareholders, more bondholders, etc., which you can uh, use in time of a crisis and you can bail in. And therefore, you can stay away or put a smaller burden on large deposit holders. In these two banks, in the Cypriot uh, case, it was impossible. I don't agree with what you say is that every, everyone was thrown in a river. I don't think that's true. I think that uh, the program has also allowed to restructure and recapitalize uh, many of the other banks in Cyprus. Uh, there was one bank that was uh, completely closed down, simply was not <coughs> viable. There's one big bank which still have a hard time uh, and they need uh, extra measures in the future. 
but the other banks have been re uh, restructured, recapitalized, etc. It's not as if the whole financial sector uh, and all the knowledge that is here in the financial services industry has been destroyed. I don't think that's true. Right. Hey, what should I, I'm sorry to say another say, small thing. Say, forgive me, but I, I, I can see like those decisions to give a show their side of the, their side of the story. Uh, I won't delve into what happened in the past. Uh, I know the secret government made many uh, mistakes. Uh, uh, also, uh, the bailing happened, so we can't change that. Uh, my my question is going to be more about the future. Uh, my generation, like people under 30. Uh, they've been the people that are, have been more affected than uh, bad decision making from both Europe and from this from, from side and the Cyprus previous Cyprus comments and and all that. So uh, I see my fellow students don't find the jobs when they finish. Uh, they've taken student loans; they can't pay back. Uh, I, personally, it's hard to find funding for postgraduate studies. Uh, what uh, what does Europe? What is Europe going to do about this? Uh, I mean, it's not fair for the young generation to pay for the older generation's mistakes. Where we were hoping to, from, to learn from this, this is a learning experience. Don't get me wrong, but uh, but uh, you have to give us a chance to breathe, and uh, so in order to make things better in the future. Thank you. Well, I think it's, uh, we've made mistakes and we learn from that because the present generation is carrying the consequences of mistakes made in the past. Um, and these consequences are very real, and they are right here, right now. So I think, um, you know, we, we do what we can in terms to support um, uh, Cyprus inside and outside the program. So within the program, of course, the 10 million, I think that allows Cyprus to maintain some of the main key uh, expenditures that have to take place. Outside the program, there are, of course, the structural funds and the cohesion funds. But on top of that, there are also the European banks. The EBRD is now going to be active also in Cyprus. can be very helpful also to get the credit flow going again. That is at the moment the key factor for the economy to pick up again. New business opportunities to be picked up, investments to take place, is credit, credit, credit. We are very much aware of that. And the key issue there is um, the, the banking sector, uh, restructuring, recapitalizing and trust. The trust factor is the hardest one because you, I can tell you, you should put your trust in your banks, but that's not how it works. Um, so both consumers and investors will be very critical on what the situation is. There are uh, a number of things that we can do. First of all, we can be fully transparent on what we're doing with the banks. The whole process of restructuring and recapitalizing but later on also the asset quality review and stress test by the European Central Bank has to be as transparent as possible. So everyone then knows what the situation in the banks is and where they can put their money. And that will allow also for uh, foreign investments to once again invest in the financial sector. I can see it taking place throughout Europe and I want it also to take place in Cyprus and I think the trust will return. That is a key thing that's needed now for the economic recovery, sound banks, sound balance sheets, new credit for new business opportunities. I don't have a magic wand that I can swing around and make it happen, but I know what we have to do. And hopefully, for young generations, that will, in as short a period as possible, uh, return to growth, return to jobs. <laughs> Is it actually so? And then uh, I would have to say that uh, I perfectly agree with you that, that uh, as of uh, as of March 2019, uh, possibly uh, the bailing was the best available option. Uh, however, uh, the cost of social sectors, I would argue, uh, was unnecessarily high because of a number of factors. First, it was publicly discussed. These things should come as a surprise. That's macro 101. It was publicly discussed, by, uh, including by EU officials. Second, uh, because of the original uh, Eurogroup uh, decision to hit unissued deposits, and third, because uh, the secret bank branches uh, uh, in Greece, uh, most problematic ones, were exempt from the haircut. And then understandably, of course, because it 
continued to freeze in the Eurozone. But then Cyprus paid uh, the financial system of Cyprus, and the importers had to pay the full cost of that. Now, in light of this, and especially in light of our record of implementation, my, my question uh, to you would be, uh, would uh, uh, the Eurozone, would the EU be willing to do something more for Cyprus? And I'll be very specific. First, in terms of funding a bad bank. Second, in terms of uh, handling uh, government, Cyprus government that held by your banks in light of the uh, October stress test in a manner that doesn't open a new hole in the system. And, and keep in mind, this, this is a patient that just came out of a coma and, and a standard stress test that might just uh, kill him off, right? So the question is, can the Eurozone do more than bad banks? Uh, or, um, uh, also from the banking side of the program, but you have to be, uh, don't get your expectations up too high, creating a bad bank. Uh, I've done so recently in the Netherlands. It's also very costly, because if you take away the risks from a bank and you put it in a separate entity, whether it's an asset management company or a bad bank or whatever you may want to call it, that also needs to be capitalized. And you also need to take losses case of the SNS Bank in the Netherlands, we took out the real estate, which was in a terrible state. We put it aside in a, in a bad bank or an asset management company. Uh, funds to the young generation, to the young people. <coughs> My main question is that in Cyprus it is known that the service sector is quite strong and still after all these problems a lot of young people are still finding jobs in accounting or lawyers is still uh, at the top priority. So why did you decide and you forced the Cyprus government to increase the company tax from 10% to 12.5%? If I'm not mistaken, it was a decision taken by the Euro group. So this is quite contradictory because it will cause some problems to our service sector. Very focused. Uh, one, of the, one of the actual solutions that are going to come from the banking sector. I think you have to realize that uh, at present, the financial sector in Europe is very fragmented, almost renationalized. Many banks have scaled down and become much more national orientated. Deposits are not being transferred across borders to be invested in other countries, but are held back within national borders, etc. The effect of this is that there are large interest differences between. Uh, countries and companies in different countries. Now there will always be a difference in interests. Uh, I mean, if you invest, if you are a building company in Spain, you will probably pay a higher interest than when you are a building company at the moment in Germany. That has to do with the problems in the housing sectors in these different countries. That is a real factor to take into account. But if the reason why companies in Spain pay a much higher interest than companies in Germany is simply because a lot of borders have been pulled up and capital is not able to flow through Europe, uh, then that is very destructive. So we have to take away all these national restrictions and allow capital to find the right balance between uh, risk and, uh, uh, and interest. Uh, uh, and that is what financial markets should do. That's how they should basically should function. The banking union hopefully will return to that situation, will take away the fragmentation, because the rules will be the same, uh, the supervision will be the same. If banks uh, are in trouble, they will be dealt with in the same way, etc. So that is a strong element um, uh, in, in the banking union. That's also uh, uh, a solution to the shortage of credits. Um, uh, in some countries there is credit available, in some countries there is, there is none. And if we can take away that fragmentation, if we can return trust to the financial sector, there will be more credit available. Um, on the uh, service sector, you're quite right, the service sector in Cyprus is very strong, it's a very good name. Um, but uh, asking a contribution also from that part of the economy it's also to do with trying to strike a fair balance. There was a massive price to be paid uh, in order to deal with the problems uh, in, the, um, in the economy and in the financial sector. We could not place that whole burden on just the government. Uh, we could not place that whole burden on the banking sector. We could not place that whole burden on the rest of the economy. 
So, <coughs> part of the burden has to be placed on the government. Uh, that's why the international debt has risen. Part of the burden had to be placed on, on the banks uh, by the principle of bailing. And part of the contribution also came from other uh, sectors in the economy. <coughs> the, the, uh, the tax that companies in Cyprus uh, paid, I think you said 10%, is uh, even in the international perspective very low, and 12.5% is still very low. Is my, the new generation, this is the best educated young generation Europe ever had. So please, oh, my oh, Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a future of Europe. Thank Just you. To complement this, uh, Mr. Dazenbrun, about the early warning system, the ECB kept putting money into the uh, key bank. Within a year, it uh, almost tripled the ELA assistance. So, in that, in that sense, it's not exactly that you know people were uh, you have a bank asking for through the uh, local central bank, of course, asking for more money, but the ECB obliged. So this adds to the shock, as it were, that uh, people were exposed to a, a year ago. <laughs> I don't know whether we should go into the ELA debate too much because, being quite frank, um, ELA and allowing banks to have ELA, ELA stands for Emergency Liquid. Uh, so uh, um, if banks need money directly and they are unable to generate it themselves through the operation of their bank, there is the possibility of the emergency instruments, and I stress the word emergency, and it is run by the national central banks, not by the ECB. Uh, now a lot can be said what went wrong there, uh, and it all boils down to we should have acted sooner, all of us. Uh, but let's not blame the ECB for giving emergency support, which actually they didn't. It was the national central bank of Cyprus which allowed the emergency support, but let's not blame uh, the ECB for the fact that we have in Europe such an emergency instrument. The question is, when do you use it and how long should you use it for? Anyway, um, on the early warning system, I think that's an interesting thought because in a, if a democracy would work correctly and people would know the kind of risks that were building up in society uh, in the way that the government or the supervisor is performing <coughs> its duties or in the way that the banks are fulfilling their uh, responsibilities, if people would know about this, maybe they would act politically. Um, uh, I'm not absolutely sure, because not all voters like to hear good, uh, sorry, like to hear bad news. Sometimes you have to tell uh, voters that, for example, we are taking uh, high risks on our environment, and that we are risking the sustainability of our planet. Yet yeah, not everyone votes green. Uh, so sometimes you can warn people and tell them that there are risks building up and uh, people might not act on them. That's why I think we need systems that will always be in place, that will always be strict and fair and firm. Uh, and a good supervisor on the basis of good capital requirements, uh, good buffer requirements where risks are being uh, built up should always be there. It should not depend on uh, the last election for the next government. Um, and I think that is one of the elements also in the program. It's an element for all the European countries. Strict supervision, making sure that these risks don't build up the way that they have built up um, uh, in the in this um, crisis. Now in terms of human rights, um, I think you have to realize that banks are private companies and when people put their money in the banks, they may think that it's safe forever, but it's not. Uh, we have a deposit guarantee system, which is national. It's been harmonized now throughout Europe, or we are in the process of harmonizing it, but it's still a national responsibility. And that basically means that every country has to build up a deposit guarantee fund in order to protect the smaller deposit holders. In my country, uh, before the crisis, it was at a very low level. We protected up to 20,000. Uh, over the course of the crisis, throughout Europe, it has been lifted to, to 100,000. It never used to be 100,000 in many countries, but it now is. But it's a guarantee that the governments give off, and the governments have to make sure that there is such a fund, and that, it's, that this guarantee is also meaningful. But you cannot turn it around. You cannot say that whoever has put money in the banks should always have the human right to get it back. 
uh, putting money in a bank is you always have to take into account is it a strong bank? Can I trust this bank? Now the key question is can civilians, can citizens know whether the bank can be trusted? And I think it's our responsibility as politicians, governments, to make sure that our banks can be trusted, at least up to the level of that 100,000. We have to put things in place, and we have to put supervision in place, capital requirements, buffers, resolution schemes, uh, etc. And that right at the end of the line, the deposit guarantee system. Uh, but if the Cypriot banks would have fallen over, if Europe hadn't intervened, etc., they would have gone bankrupt. There was no deposit guarantee system that could have saved all those depositors. So you have to realize, if you build up a very big banking sector, you must also build up a very big deposit guarantee system. And we didn't have it. And not just in Cyprus, in many countries, we didn't have it. So we were giving off a guarantee, but we didn't have the system to guarantee the guarantee. This is the truth. And we, are, we have to address all these issues. And the deposit guarantee is one of them. We have two minutes left. The minister needs to go to the airport. So I will give the chance to the young man at the back. Just in a, in a single minute, please, to raise your question, and the minister will respond. Good afternoon. I'm a student from the uh, economic department. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming today and being with us and uh, give a, giving us the opportunity to share our concept with you. Uh, I will be very clear. Uh, many Cypriot uh, take into consideration the bad example of Greece. Uh, believe that we are going to need more and more support, economic support from Europe. In other words, they believe that we are going to run in a circle without an end. Uh, what is your opinion about that? <clears throat> I don't think that's true at all. I think that um, um, in, in essence the Cypriot economy is strong. There is a, are a number of strong sectors which are surviving this crisis and the financial sector will survive this crisis. And we, the Cypriot government and the European institutions are now doing what has to be done in regard to the financial sector. There's a restructuring going on, uh, new management is being put in place, the supervisor is being strengthened, recapitalization will take place, and as I said, the work is not done, the program is not finished, more money is still in the program and can be used if necessary. But we have to go through this. Uh, there is no easy way. And I don't think at the moment that uh, more funds from Europe will help. I think the strengthening of the economy has to come, as it always has done in Cyprus, from private initiative, from private businesses being able to invest once again. And in order for them to, to be able to invest, we need to get the banking sector right as soon as possible. That's the crucial priority now. Uh, all the elements are there. It takes time, but a lot of work has been done in a year's time. I, I can only uh, uh, express my admiration for the work that's been done. I realize that it's taking a great toll of society in terms of unemployment, poverty, etc. Uh, but the sooner we do it, the quicker we do it, the better uh, the recovery and the stronger the recovery is. And once again, as I said, uh, Cyprus is, is in many ways different from, from Greece. So I don't think it's very fruitful or helpful to keep comparing the two. Uh, Cyprus uh, has, to do, uh, has to recover sooner and quicker than Greece has done. I wish also that Greece would uh, recover quicker and sooner. They are doing better a lot already, but I, I think Cyprus can recover in a shorter time. Thank you, Mr. President. I think I wish we had more time for this. Uh, I'm sure there are many more questions, and uh, uh, we like your uh, your responses. But, um, I think it's been a nice, candid, uh, interesting conversation. I hope, we have, I hope we have a chance to see you in person, not just on our TV screens in the future here. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all people here uh, in thanking you for your presence in our university. Thank you.